So Bex Lyons is a teaching associate in English and late medievalist. She has research interests in books and publishing and the history of the book, especially female owners of 15th and 16th century Arthurian literature, if you uh, want to get into the nitpick details of it. She also has a, has a wide range of affiliations with Arthurian studies and the history of the book across multiple institutions. In, at Bristol, Bex teaches on a number of units, including the fairy tale in English and uh, Chaucer and the Chaucerians. Alongside being nominated for today's Best of Bristol lecture for her inspiring and engaging teaching, she also won the Postgraduate Teacher of the Year Award at the University of York back in 2014. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome and please join me in welcoming Dr. Bex Lyons. and thank you for being here. I kind of expected it to be just me and my mum who's in the audience, so I'm really heartened to see that there's a few more of you here. I have had a bit of a cold-type cough thing, so I'll try not to cough into the microphone. But thank you for being here. Um, I would like to thank as well the Best of Bristol team for putting this together. It's such a fantastic, wonderfully varied lecture series, as you can see here. Um, my title. Um, and, you know, being an adult, being an academic can feel a bit tough sometimes, so it's really nice to just occasionally have a pat on the back, you know, well done, you're doing okay, and I think it's really lovely that the Best of Bristol Lecture Series does this. Um, I want to thank my students, because this is student-led, student-nominated, and, and they're the ones who put me forward for this, completely to my surprise. Um, there's clearly something about medievalists because I do follow in the footsteps of another colleague in the English department, Dr. Gareth Griffith, who um, is also a medievalist, who was also a Best of Bristol lecturer two years ago, I think, last year. Um, and I do strongly urge you, if you have an hour going free, go and look up his lecture online. It's really, really good. Um, it was a real surprise to me, actually, to be nominated because uh, I only graduated with my own PhD last July um, and I only gave my first lecture just over a year ago. Um, and I'm not actually a lecturer, I'm a teaching associate. So, you know, it was huge surprises all around. Lovely surprises, but really, really big ones. Um, and the last people that I would like to thank is, you know, everyone who's helped me so far in my academic journey. Um, it's been quite a journey, and I'll tell you something about it in a moment. Um, but I'd like to thank my family, friends, my academic colleagues, some of whom are here, um, uh, and my fiancé, my mum, who's over there. <coughs> it's all getting a little bit Oscars now, though, so I'll, I'll move on, um, and we'll get on with the show. So in their nominations for me, my students specifically requested that I should talk to you about medieval romance. So that's what I'm going to inflict upon you for the next 40 minutes or so, and you can thank them for that. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some unexpected journeys and meetings. And this is both within uh, and, and with this body of literature. And the journeys and meetings are really my own personal experiences, both in terms of the kind of physical, geographical, intellectual, emotional journeys, all the journeys that I've been on, um, and all the many meetings that it's prompted in my life, uh, this body of literature. Um, and I really want to use my own personal experiences as kind of a, a case study or a way in to think about um, the broader value of reading medieval literature. And any literature really which is, you know, outside of our comfort zones, perhaps a bit alien to us, a bit different, a bit challenging. Um, and the potential benefits of resonating with the voices of the past. So sit back, relax, I'm going to take you on a quest through medieval romance. Uh, so first of all, what is it? Well, I'd best get this out of the way right now at the outset and probably disappoint quite a lot of you, but medieval romance isn't just all about romance and love. I mean, as you can see from some of these images from medieval romance manuscripts, I mean, they do crop up fairly frequently, but that's not what it's all about. Um, and put simply, medieval romance is a genre of literature that's really popular from the 12th century right through until the end of the Middle Ages um, and even on into the early modern period. 
and it sows the seeds, the literary seeds, for what would later become the modern novel, um, and it preempts and influences many other genres, um, perhaps some surprising ones. TV soaps, like EastEnders, take their inspiration from medieval romance. You know, something to keep you interested there. Um, and they were sort of the medieval equivalent to today's bestsellers. So one medieval scholar, Nicola MacDonald, um, has referred to medieval romances as pulp fiction. That's quite an interesting way to think about them. Um, just like this kind of delightful book that we have here, um, which obviously takes its inspiration from medieval romance and was, I am sure, a bestseller. <coughs> genre called romance, so misleadingly, if it's not just all about love and romance. Well, hold on to your hats, because this is a great bit of pub trivia. Uh, it comes from the old French romans, which, again, doesn't really have anything to do with love. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, this word, romans, initially meant anything in the vernacular. I'm throwing some big words at you, I'm sorry, and some old French words. Um, but by vernacular, at this point in the Middle Ages, you really mean anything that's not in Latin. So in France, it would be French. Um, and it came to mean, so this word romans, came to mean tales that particularly discussed ideas of courtly love, chivalry, adventure, um, and usually featuring the elites of society. But in order to define medieval romance, it can be useful to think about what it was kind of um, situated against or in opposition to bearing in mind that throughout the Middle Ages, um, Latin was the language of learning and the church, um, and it was kind of the formal language of learned ecclesiastical men and just a very, very few uh, women. But vernacular languages, like French, were open to all members of that society, in spoken form at least, if not written, whether you were secular or religious, male or female. So the vernacular um, became the language of entertainment um, and popular culture, particularly in terms of elite lay culture in the first instance, so courts and wealthy households. Um, although later this kind of literature would spread uh, into broad, broader popular culture. So hormones, romance, became a shorthand for this kind of literature. Literary works in the vernacular as opposed to kind of clerical writing. So, where did this trendy, new, popular, non-clerical literary genre spring from? Um, well, we see medieval romance evolving from a number of secular literary traditions, uh, as well as older tales and stories that were circulating via the spoken word. And this included things like translations of Latin epics, adaptations from the chronicle tradition, chronicles dealing kind of loosely with history, uh, reworkings of Celtic folk traditions, such as uh, a type of verse poem called the Breton Lay. So it's kind of a mishmash. It takes its inspiration from all of these different uh, genres that are pre-circulating. Um, and in the first instance, we see uh, romance evolving in the mid-12th century, in Anglo-Norman, at the English court, um, and around the same time in French, a guy called Chrétien de Troyes, who is the father of Arthurian romance. He is crafting new Arthurian romances for his patroness, Marie de Champagne, who is Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter. <coughs> so very affluent, kind of high-status audiences there. And then romance spread to um, German courts, and Italian and Spain followed, but they get their romance tradition from a slightly different uh, place. Um, and then in the 13th and 15th centuries, um, we see romances emerging in Middle English. So, Anglo-Norman, French, German, Italian, Spanish, we get them in Welsh, Middle English. Uh, romance is a deeply European tradition uh, embodying the best ideals of kind of cross-fertilisation of ideas and people and cultural exchange, and, you know, it's a timely moment to remember this right now. Um, so we could say that romance itself is very much a product of meetings and journeys. 
But as far as I remember, uh, I first knowingly encountered medieval romance in its Middle English forms. Um, and the development of this body of literature in Middle English is quite interesting. So just as romance was kind of a reaction to, or developed in opposition to, or as something different to Latin uh, clerical writing, um, the first translators of French romances into English uh, make similar claims like this about broadening the availability of their work, um, and they give these reasons for translating romances into English. So for example, have a look at this quotation from the first translator of the French prose Merlin romance, uh, writing at the beginning of the 14th century. So they say, French use this gentle man, at Evelich, English, English can. Uh, and that means the gentry may speak French, but every English person knows English. Uh, so the use of the English language here is depicted as kind of opening up this type of literature to other classes beyond the Anglo-Norman elite in England. So everyone can understand the language, the common language. So romance has always, at least ostensibly, um, had a concern and association with broadening its audience, extending its journey beyond the social elite, and forging new meetings with readers, maybe hammering home this doing of the meetings theme. Uh, and despite conveying social ideologies and norms, it also is a genre that's involved with questioning them um, and deconstructing them in many ways. And this is quite useful and thought-provoking and perhaps surprisingly subversive in many ways. So what does a medieval romance look like? What features? might we expect to see? Well, some of this, I'm sure, is what you're expecting when you think about tales of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. We've got knights, that's fairly obvious, I suppose. They're always dashing and strong and brave. Um, we've got beautiful ladies, and these are always superlative, the most beautiful. How they can all be the most beautiful, I'm not sure, but somehow they are. Um, we've got fairy mistresses, enchantresses, sorceresses, um, and these can be good or bad, or a bit of both. Think the Lady of the Lake, who gives King Arthur his sword, Excalibur. Think Morgan Le Fay, who's Arthur's half-sister, who weaves in and out of the stories. We've got this concept called the fair unknown, la belle inconnue. Um, and that's really when knights rock up in disguise at tournaments and things like that. And everyone, it's a bit like Clark Kent when he puts his glasses on and no one knows he's Superman. This is going on in medieval romance. That's where they get it from, right? Marvel and DC. Um, we've got dragons, giants, monsters of all kinds that you could imagine. Fun stuff. Uh, magic and the supernatural, also very fun. Uh, May and spring. So lots of romances are set around this time with all their associations of kind of burgeoning of new life and lusts and things, you know. Uh, around about now, in fact, I guess. We've got quests. Knights are always venturing off to various places to go on various quests. Um, same with the jousting, always having to prove themselves. Celtic folklore motifs. So we see these carrying over into romances, and whether that's having the action set in kind of Celtic locations like Cornwall or Ireland, or having Celtic stuff, objects kind of cropping up, like love potions and rings. Courtly love. Um, romances often question what this should look like. What's the ideal courtly love between a knight and his lady? They're very interested in this. Chivalry. How should knights behave? Um, how can you best be a knight? Christianity. Again, how can you be your best Christian self as a knight? Um, and lots of romances are kind of based around the Christian calendar. There are lots of events that happen at Pentecost. Lots of things happen at Pentecost. Um, social elites. Not many peasants in medieval romance. They're not interested. There are clashes between good and evil. Um, yes, standard. And we get these individual journeys kind of set against broader backdrops and contexts. So if you find yourself reading something, that has several or all of these uh, factors in it, you might be reading a medieval romance or something that has descended from or taken its influence from along the way. 
medieval romance. And this is as awesome as it sounds. I mean, I'm not biased in the slightest, but medieval romance is just the best. Um, and they might only have some of these characteristics, but still be called romances. And the skill for medieval authors was really to take this list of ingredients, whack them together, mix them together in new and exciting ways, and to do interesting things with them, you know, surprise their readers. Um, and sometimes this takes the form of parody. So, um, for instance, Chaucer, he sets his nun's priest's tail in a chicken coop. So instead of knights and ladies, we get hens and cocks, you know, marching around the chicken coop. Um, so... That's really what we're looking for in romance. Um, and they were written to serve a number of purposes. Entertainment, but also really, really up there. They've got to be fun. All that stuff is very fun. But romances also have serious functions and uses political propaganda. So, for instance, King Arthur was held up by the Welsh as being this symbol of hope for Welsh, you know, rising back up against their Norman conquerors at some point. Um, we see romances being used to convey some kind of religious or spiritual or moral education. So they're teaching us how to be a good person and how to behave within our societies. And they offer us models of courage loyalty, you know, all these things we're meant to exemplify. Um, they try to show us how to be a good Christian, so things like the Grail Quest um, is all about that. Um, they reinforce social hierarchies a lot of the time, so uh, as well as, you know, gender roles, status, um, and this includes things like behavioural aspects, you know, how should you behave if you are caught in the elite? kind of qualities should you have? Uh, things like gentillesse, which is politeness, good manners, largesse, which is being generous, giving all your stuff away. Um, at the same time, though, they often undermine or play with some of these kind of social hierarchies and behaviours and roles, um, and some romances kind of are a bit more ironic and poke fun at these things, or or pit some of these things against each other. You know, what happens when you're the ideal knight, you've got chivalry, but you also want to be the ideal courtly lover? Ooh, how can you joust all the time if you're with your lady all the time? So romance is often kind of tussle with these kind of concepts. Say things about national identity. So we get, um, for instance, the matter of Britain, which thinks about British heroes and what it is to be British. Um, and probably the oddest function of medieval romances is that sometimes they serve as kind of genealogies for rich patrons. So kind of giving yourself um, a line of heritage. For instance, there's um, a series of romances about someone called Melusine, who's this kind of half serpent lady. Um, and the royal family um, of Lusignan used her as kind of their ancestress. They claimed her as their ancestress. Yeah, I'm not sure. So writers of romances, like Chrétien de Troyes, therefore suggested that romances combine matière, which is kind of the subject matter, you know, the stuff, uh, and sens, or this deeper kind of inner meaning, and that we're perhaps meant to think about romances, and they're intended to provoke debate amongst their readers and listeners. Um, and as the scholar... Helen Cooper says, medieval literature shares with earlier writing from the Hebrew Bible to Beowulf the function of recording the ideology of an entire community, the values by which it represents itself to itself. Romance, as the dominant secular literary genre of the period, was at the heart of such self-representation, a means by which cultural values and ideals were recorded and maintained and promulgated. But as I've already suggested, romance perhaps isn't as straightforward as just representing the ideals of a culture. Sometimes it also calls them into question too. So they occupy this really interesting and quite ambiguous space um, that both kind of reinforces and holds up the status quo, as well as going, hmm, are we sure about this? And it makes for really rich reading. Oh, I think so anyway. So. 
I've spent a fair bit of time so far describing to you what medieval romance is, because I just came assuming that you might not know. So now, hopefully, you're all experts in the subject. You can spot one a mile off. You can go out and read them. Um, but though we've seen some journeys and some meetings undertaken by the literary genre itself as it spreads across Europe uh, and different demographics of readers, I did promise you some more personal meetings and journeys. This is probably the cringy part of the lecture. <coughs> um, just as a case study, really, to hopefully persuade you that medieval romance and medieval literature more broadly are not just important for what they can tell us about the past and its people, but they're also useful places to resonate with voices outside of our own experience. Because sometimes I think we can get a bit locked into our own echo chambers, particularly with social media, uh, you know, reinforcing our views. So we can really benefit from just stepping outside of our own experience every now and then. And medieval romance is great for that. I mean, do we have any knights in the room? <laughs> Shame. Um, so in terms of my own experience as well, it would be no exaggeration to say that medieval romance has profoundly shaped my life. I mean, look where I am right now, what, am I, what, I'm, what I'm doing with my life. So let's think about that. So, just soak it in. I was first, uh, no, I was 19, I wasn't 14, so that would be, I'd be a child prodigy. I was 19 when I made my first significant journey um, and my first significant meeting with medieval romance. And I'd moved from my native East London up to Bangor, a tiny, anyone been to Bangor? One, two people, oh, you must go. Oh, three people, excellent. Uh, tiny, tiny little city in North Wales, kind of nestled between the mountains and the sea. Such a pure, lovely place. Um, and I'd gone up there to study for an undergraduate degree in English uh, with no real plan in place apart from I just love reading books and I love literature and I wanted to spend three years doing that. Um, so that's what I did. And there I am, 19-year-old Bex, making some bad choices with hair dye, as I think you have to do as an undergraduate. But I should more accurately say that this was really a re-meeting um, or a rediscovery of medieval romance because I had already encountered Arthur and the constellation of characters at his court um, from a much earlier age in stories many, many, many times over from my childhood onwards. And there's me, age four. Um, you know, my mum's bedtime stories I had this amazing pop-up book that had this Camelot castle that popped up from the middle. Um, at primary school, I won this amazing purple hardback book of Roger Lancelin Green's um, translation of the Mort d'Arthur. Um, films like The Sword in the Stone. So it really felt like this uncanny re-meeting of old friends when I went to university and met Arthur and all of his pals again. And at this point in my degree, we were studying a module on Arthurian literature. And this one particular week, we were looking at Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, uh, this Ar Arthurian masterpiece, uh, meaning the death of Arthur. Um, and this was completed around 1471. And I've given you a page from uh, that book here just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Uh, it's one of my all-time faves. I recommend it. Um, so, Professor Maluka Radulescu was teaching us that in that module at around the same time as Dr. Susan Jodowski was teaching us uh, the Canterbury Tales in, in another module. And I really vividly remember both of them reading out loud in Middle English for the first time and going, whoa, what is this? This is amazing because it's so familiar but so weird at the same time. Uh, and it was really inspiring to hear these two female lecturers just talking about something that they loved. They loved it and that just came through. Um, and I was so enchanted, I was so hooked. So thanks to Sue and Raluca for giving me the medieval bug. Um, I should say Middle English is what comes after Old English or Anglo-Saxon, kind of before the early modern English that Shakespeare's knocking about. Um, it's just that period in the middle, in the Middle Ages. So here's an example of some Middle English. 
Um, and it's not too scary, this one, actually. There's, there's some worse out there. Uh, and this is from Mallory's great work. Lord Arthur, that we were reading that, that week, with Ruby And this is from the episode of The Poison Apple in the book of Lancelot and Guinevere, which is the penultimate section of the overall book. And this is the point where we start to see the frictions and the factions developing in, in the court of King Arthur. Um, the factions that would eventually lead to the downfall of the Arthurian kingdom and, spoiler alert, the death of Arthur. So, at this point in the story, Lancelot, the greatest knight, has just returned from the Grail quest, which he's failed miserably on. He hasn't seen the Grail. Do you know why? Because he loves Guinevere, and he can't stop thinking about her while he's on this Grail quest. Guinevere being Arthur's queen. <gasps> it's all very problematic. So he couldn't attain the level of spiritual purity needed in order to be able to see the Grail, and he comes home a bit dejected about it. So I'll just read, read this to you. Then, as the book has saved, Sir Lancelot began to resort unto Queen Guinevere again and forgot the promise and the perfection that he made in the quest. For as the book has saith, had not Sir Lancelot been in his previ sochters and in his mindes so set her inwardly to the queen as he was in seeming outward to God, there had no knicht passed him in the quest of the St. Grail. But ever his thoughts privily were on the queen, and so they loved together more hotter than they did to forehand, and had many such privy drofties together that many in the quarter spack of it, and in especial Sir Agravain, Sir Gawain's brother, for he was ever open-mouthed. It is like EastEnders, isn't it? So now Lancelot's back from the quest, and him and Guinevere are just picking up their relationship. Where it left off, he's learned nothing. And people are starting to gossip. Uh, and although it's painfully obvious throughout the Mort d'Arthur that Lancelot is just... I mean, Mallory is a total fanboy of Lancelot. He loves Lancelot. Lancelot is his favourite. Uh, and there's very little love lost between the author and Guinevere. He doesn't seem so keen on her. It's her character that I really vividly remember meeting for the first time um, as an undergraduate. And that meeting changed my life. Uh, and to show you why, I'll keep reading from this page, but I'll, I'll ditch the Middle English pronunciation just to make life easier for us all. So it befell that Sir Lancelot had many resorts of ladies and damsels, which daily resorted unto him, that besought him to be their champion. In all such matters of right, Sir Lancelot applied him daily to do for the pleasure of our Lord Jesus Christ. And ever as much as he might, he withdrew him from the company of Queen Guinevere, for to eschew the slander and the noise. Wherefore the Queen waxed wroth with Sir Lancelot. So... One day she called him to her chamber and said thus, Sir Lancelot, I see and feel daily that your love beginneth to slack, for ye have no joy to be in my presence, but ever ye are out of this court, and quarrels and matters ye have nowadays for ladies, maidens, and gentlewomen, more than ever ye were wont to beforehand. So Lancelot is being approached by all the ladies and all the damsels of the court, and at the same time, he's removing himself from Guinevere's presence, supposedly to stop the gossiping. And this is understandably quite hurtful to Guinevere. She's not happy about it at all, uh, and it makes her pretty angry. So as a result, she brings it up with him in what I think is a very forthright manner, as we see here. And perhaps from this kind of brief uh, excerpt or two, you get a sense of some of the real tensions that are kind of underlying at the Arthurian court here, even just within this kind of love triangle. Um, you know, the, this adulterous affair really creates some fraught emotion, especially as Lancelot is best friends with Arthur, but he's in love with Arthur's wife. Ah. And I'm going to say something controversial here, but I just don't buy Arthur as a three-dimensional character. You know, he's too perfect, too aloof, too kingly, I suppose, for me to ever kind of meet with on a personal level. Um, and pre-Raphaelite writer William Morris, 
Booth Show Times 14 today, uh, wrote a poem called The Defence of Guinevere, and I think he sums it up nicely because he has Guinevere saying, I was bought by King Arthur's great name and his little love. And I feel that. I feel that for poor Guinevere. And Lancelot's response to Guinevere at this point is pretty weak too. He says, Madam, you must hold me excused. And then he goes on to list all the reasons that he's chatting to these ladies. And he blames Guinevere for his not achieving the Grail quest. It takes two to tango, Lancelot, is all I'm going to say. Um, and he uses these other women, so he says, as kind of a cover to stop the gossips. He says, I'm doing this for us, Guinevere. You know, I have to flirt with these ladies so that people don't gossip about us. So this is a tricky situation, and Guinevere doesn't really have much of a leg to stand on in terms of being jealous because she is married to another guy, so it, I mean, it's all very dodgy. Um, and after Lancelot gives these really quite weak reasons for why he's doing this, this is Guinevere's response. All this while, so while Lancelot's giving his lame reasons, the Queen stood still and let Sir Lancelot say what he would. And when he had all said, when he'd finished, she burst out weeping. And so she sobbed and wept a great while. And when she might speak, she said, Sir Lancelot, now I well understand that thou art a false recreant knight and a common lecturer, and lovest and holdest other ladies, and of me thou hast disdain and scorn. For wipe thou well, for you know well, uh, now I understand thy falsehood, I shall never love thee more. And look, thou be never so hardy to come in my sight. And right here I discharge thee this court, that thou never come within it, and I forfend thee my fellowship, and upon pain of thy head that thou see me never more. <laughs> yeah. So she basically has a complete emotional meltdown, throws a huge strop, and kicks Lancelot out of the court. Um, forever. After this point, she then goes on to throw a huge dinner party for all the other knights to be like, I'm fine, I'm, fine. I'm really fine about this, um, which goes horribly wrong for many reasons. Um, but, I mean, her behaviour here, yes, is admittedly problematic. She's a queen, but she's kind of behaving like she isn't here. She's just booted out the champion of Camelot and her own personal champion, which is mm, not the wisest thing to do politically. But instead of using her head and her political diplomacy, she's using her heart and she's using her feelings. And 19-year-old Bex reading this thought, oh, I love it, this is great. What a brilliant woman. She's so flawed um, and she's so kind of out there. But I just really related to her. She was a revelation, really. And... Um, I fell head over heels in love with Guinevere. She's demanding and she's impulsive and she's loving and she's jealous and she's high maintenance. God, is she high maintenance. And uh, she makes terrible choices. And I just felt such an affinity with her for all of this. Um, she's so beautifully flawed. She just springs out of this 500 year old book to me as a real person. It's someone I can really relate to. I can't relate to Arthur. And I'm sure this wasn't Mallory's intention when he wrote Guinevere this way. He's probably not meant to want to emulate her. But she is the one that spoke to me. And the effect that this had on me was really profound. And this might sound weird. You know, why would I own up to, let alone be proud of, feeding an affinity with an adulterous queen who is amazing at throwing strops? Well, consider... You are the only child of a single working class parent. Furthermore, you are a girl who grew up on a frankly fairly grotty council estate in East London and you went to a bog standard comprehensive school. Both your grandparents left school at 14. No one in your family's ever been to university. And suddenly, far from home, up in the wilds of North Wales, you've met this multifaceted woman who feels like a reflection of yourself in a book that's half a millennium old. And she's a queen. <laughs> so it's weirdly aspirational. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Um, you know, it was, it was really deeply transformative to me because Guinevere's humanity, her flawed humanity, really opened a door to the rest of medieval literature for me. Her emotion kind of acted as a conduit. And before I knew it, I began to notice many more meeting places and familiarities in the medieval literature that I was reading. 
And I realized that, you know, although the turns of phrase might be very different, and we certainly don't speak Middle English anymore, and some of the humor perhaps doesn't translate so well without context, and you certainly don't see so many knights riding along anymore, alas. Um, but medieval literature taught me that on a fundamental level, at least, humans are humans are humans across time and space and geography. And medieval romance taught me that we all worry about the same fundamental things. Death, betrayal, loneliness. You know, we all want the same things. Friendship, love, to be valued. And we all, you know, to a 19-year-old, that's pretty deep stuff. That's a pretty important lesson to learn. It's kind of universal empathy for my fellow human beings. And I began to see that we're all far more similar than we are different, thanks to Guinevere. So this one kind of profound meeting resulted in many others, and I found my bliss to be very corny. Um, and I followed it to a master's, and then to a PhD, and now to uh, a permanent academic role here at the University of Bristol. And I became not only the first person in my family to go to university, but the first person to become a doctor, which was a thrill. Um, and I've traveled the world, to speak at conferences about this stuff and to research in archives and libraries and to share ideas. Um, and to me, I mean, it's just amazing. I've become a teacher myself. These people who so inspired me as a 19-year-old, I'm now hopefully that person. Um, and I can pass that on. And my whole world has expanded and grown um, thanks to medieval literature. And these resonances are important. You know, why should you care about little old me from a council estate in East London and my love of medieval romance? Well, because unfortunately, I'm gonna get a little bit serious here, I apologize. Other groups and discourses in recent years have also picked up on the medieval period and have twisted the perspective of it to suit their own agendas. And I don't really want to grant them any more space than is absolutely necessary here, but I'm thinking particularly of far-right and neo-Nazi groups that have, for instance, drawn on Anglo-Saxon literature to justify their own harmful views about you know, what sort of people are more or less valid than others, for instance. And they would use the literature of the Middle Ages for divisive purposes to place wedges between different people and, and populations. And this is perhaps some of the harm that having an overwhelmingly white, male, Christian, British, medieval literary canon can do. It can be used in this way to kind of authenticate and normalize some hierarchies and centers. But this is why we need universities. We need diverse experts on this literature to kind of suggest it's other depths and uses and meanings. And we need these kind of soul-shaking, transformative moments of meeting people who are not like us, whether they're on the page or in reality. People from completely different contexts in terms of time, space, social status. And the study of the arts and humanities, I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you, helps to make us better people, sort of more compassionate human beings. So, I mean, just to sum up, really, at the age of 19, I put my ear to the past using medieval romance, and, and what I heard it whispering back to me was that we're all very similar, and we all feel, and we're all connected in perhaps unexpected ways, and that this is a really beautiful and important thing. I also heard it saying that we can all be emotionally complex and deeply flawed, but still be fierce queens, like Guinevere, um, and I would encourage you to go on your own journeys and, and meet people of the past and people from other contexts. Find your own inner Guinevere's as well. Um, and that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bex, for that lecture. We do have some time for questions, if anyone would like to ask some. I'm going to uh, throw this. <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning um, that. Sorry, can we get this speaker into the black? Hello. 
Um, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, Spain um, got their romance from somewhere else. I just wondered where. Yes, the Reconquista tradition, which I have to be frank and hold my hands up and say I don't know too much about. We do have other experts in the room who might know more than me. Not naming any names. Marianne. <laughs> the sports test, if not the um, <laughs> medieval literature one. Uh, yes, yeah, Spain, Spain had a different tradition. Uh, Latin comes into all of it because that's the kind of high culture, the, the, the learned people would have Latin. But there's a real folk tradition of ballads in Spain, uh, which fed into the, the growing medieval romance. But I think the real thing to take away from what Bex was saying at the beginning is this international nature of medieval romance. You are really talking about a European culture. So the kind of, it's really hard to look at a map and not see, um, to, look, you know, to not see modern borders. But Bex was talking about French and Middle English. I mean, French is, is just as important for English literature in the Middle Ages. And actually French was quite important in Spain, in Northern Spain at that time as well. So you've got all these influences and yeah, things are developing differently in Spain because of the folk ballad tradition as much as anything else. But, but you've still got those same influences as well of the Latin epic narratives and of the French text, particularly actually Southern French Occitan literature, which is creating the courtly love ethos, which is imp really important in all these literatures as well. I won't go into any more detail because this is Be <laughs> Bex's questions, really. <laughs> no, it's good because I didn't know the answer. So. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I've never read any medieval romance, but um, now I'd really like yeah. to. And I just wondered if you had any advice about how to approach um, engaging with these texts and whether there are any entry level texts that yes. might be uh, a this good a starting point. Great question. And in fact, uh, my colleague Leah Tethener and I um, are working on kind of Penguin editions and translations of medieval texts. Um, so Penguin, I mean, modern editions are amazing and they've got all this kind of extra information to help you kind of get into the text and engage with it and introductions and glossaries. Um, but for some really fun stuff, obviously I'd recommend Mallory. It's a bit heavy, it was quite long. Um, but if you just want to get a bit of a gist, I'd say Marie de France. Um, she writes uh, lays, so the kind of shorter sort of precursors to medieval romance. Um, fun, romantic, supernatural stuff. There's a werewolf. So yeah, I'd say Marie de France, give her a go. It's all right. I just want to ask, because you were talking about sort of the different languages and the European languages and everything and how English was the language but I just want to ask about sort of the Welsh language in relation to that sort of thing and especially how you're talking like English is the language of the upper classes mm -hmm. but then how does that sort of disdain for the Welsh language sort of play into that? Yeah I don't know if I'd say that English was the language of the upper classes it was certainly the language of the people so for the more kind of common commonly spoken language um, but yes, the Welsh stuff is really interesting. So I don't know if you've heard of uh, a kind of a collection of stories called the Mabinogion. Um, there's, I think, three or four Welsh romances in that, which you, you can really see the shared tradition there with the French material. Um, but they also do some really interesting different things with it, you know, and there's definitely a kind of more Celtic tradition coming through there. So... Yeah, I'd say if you are interested in that, check out the Mabinogion. And that is in a modern edition as well, so very accessible. Any other questions? Um, I could take that one as well. I did have one question myself that cropped up, which was you said you'd been to sort of conferences around the world talking mm -hmm. about this sort of stuff. Does medieval sort of European romance have a sort of a global demand or is, it, is the study and research of it sort of still centred within Europe? No, not at all. In fact, one of the biggest um, medieval conferences is in a, <laughs> it's a very random name, is in a place called Kalamazoo in Michigan. Um, and that's where kind of medievalists all descend once a year and talk about all this stuff. 
Uh, but no, I mean, it's happening everywhere. We just had a conference last year or the year before in Würzburg, in Germany, um, all over the place. It's, it's becoming very popular. But I think the other interesting thing is that there's much more of a movement now looking at the global Middle Ages and, you know, trying not to focus perhaps so much on this Western idea of the Middle Ages. Um, so, yeah, there's lots going on with literatures from all around the world from the Middle Ages, which is lovely. Obviously, I'm just talking about medieval romance now, but there's loads of cool stuff. So, yeah. Any final questions for anyone else? Yes. Oh, here's trouble. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Bex, for that great talk. Um, and I thought it was great how you were talking about how you can, it's, even though it's a challenging type of material, there are ways and means of finding your way through it. Um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, though, um, is dealing with the language. Mm. Now, some of the Middle English we saw this evening is some of the easier stuff to handle because it's in prose, it's later medieval, all those sorts of things. But of course, you know, when we both know that when students first see, let's say, the Gawain poet in action um, with his yeah. northern dialect and his poetry and all of those kind of things, it becomes very much more difficult. And I wondered if you had some top tips for anyone who wanted to try and start reading that. Yes. Oh, that's a great question, Leah. Thank you. Well, I always think about how I kind of responded to Middle English when I first encountered it. And I think it's really important to kind of use your own experiences to guide, you know, the way you help others. And some of the students in my class as an undergraduate could not get to grips with Middle English at all. I think they were really kind of um, intimidated by it because it does look a bit weird. And like I say, some of the stuff that I showed you was not too bad. You could probably muddle your way through it if you didn't have any knowledge. But the way I think to make Middle English friendlier and less intimidating is just to see it as badly spelled modern English. And look, medievalists will absolutely <laughs> tell me off for this. But that's kind of the way I approached it as an undergraduate. And it makes it less scary. The other thing to bear in mind with Middle English is it's a total hodgepodge of German, French, Latin, Norse, um, Celtic languages. So if you have other languages, you know, if you're a French, um, then bring that with you and that will help you to kind of access it as well I think um, yeah and get a good glossary there are normally glossaries in the backs of modern editions which is so helpful but yes you're right it can be quite quite a task well, yeah, the reason I ask is I think um, things like the penguin translations are, are absolutely wonderful things and have made medieval literature so much more accessible to, to, to people even outside of the university context. It's not just people studying it. If, if somebody ha has a particular interest, they could read it in that edition. But actually, one of the great things, I think, especially in respect of what you were talking about, is the opportunity to access a different culture. Mm. And language is so important in understanding yeah. alternative cultures. Um, so, you know, the opportunity to really engage with the original language makes yeah. you see the content of the text in a totally different way as well. It so does. that's that was really the purpose of the question. So thank you for yeah, answering no, it. it does. You're right. Thanks, Leia. <laughs> we weren't built for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the relationship of influence between uh, medieval romance and... Uh, Irish mythology, which mm -hmm. is a bit earlier, like, oh, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, Kulain yeah. and stuff Cahoulin like that. Or, yeah. or was that mostly curtailed by the dominance of the Roman church as opposed to the Irish church? Well, it's a different tradition. So, I mean, things happen kind of on a different time scale. That was a good question, thank you, um, over in Ireland. Um, one of the things I do, actually, is I teach in Bath um, Myths and Legends of Britain and Ireland, and we look at texts like the Toyne, which is kind of an Irish mythological text. Um, and in terms of kind of shared traditions there, I think we can certainly see similar tropes feeding in, similar motifs. Um, for instance... In the Toyne, we have a character called Maeve, who is very much a kind of sovereignty, um, almost goddess-type figure. Um, and then in medieval romance, we have figures who kind of resonate with that as well, like Morgan Le Fay, who seem to be very kind of, um, particularly in earlier texts, tied to the land. You know, she lives on Avalon, the Isle of Apples. Um, so we certainly see common themes coming through. Now, I don't know of any Irish texts that have specifically kind of gone through into romance. 
Again, there might be some people in the room who know more about that than I do. But it's a good question. We certainly, again, thinking about this kind of universal human interests, we certainly see those across the Irish mythology and romance. You know, how to be a hero, um, how to defeat people, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Thanks again for a really interesting talk. Um, you mentioned Marvel superheroes, which uh, <laughs> made my ears prick up. I, I, I'm aware of the sort of the Norse influences on that, but mm. what, um, what, what are the medieval parts of that? Well, I mean, just the fact that we have heroes. Um, knights really are a, a type of hero. King Arthur is a hero. So I think we see kind of the construction of the heroic identity in medieval romance really feeding through into things like Marvel and DC. Um, and we see them totally just pinching uh, bits and pieces from medieval romance, like turning up in disguise, oh, no one recognizing you, and oh. And that allows you to do kind of different things as a hero when no one kind of knows who you are. So yeah, medieval romance has just inspired everything, is the takeaway message. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Bex. That, that was really fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I very seldom get to, get to listen to any Middle English or um, Medieval English, and I, I'm thinking particularly of uh, Gawain, which, which, mm. which the very small excerpts I've heard, it's, it's really fascinating, quite, quite mystifying yet. Yeah. Compelling. Yeah. Do you, are there any sort of podcasts out there or audio resources that you can recommend? And do you, do you think listening to these texts makes life easier for a non medievalist like me? Hmm. <laughs> for your last question, possibly not, unless you can follow along with the book at the same time and then go, oh, okay, that's how that word's meant to sound. Yeah. And in terms of kind of um, recordings, they, they certainly are out there. I know this because when we were studying Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, my students said, oh, I found it on YouTube and I listened to the Middle English. Oh. So, I mean, there must be some out there. I, I'm not entirely sure where they are. But no, it is really fascinating and this kind of weird, uncanny half recognition. It's so strange yet familiar, in yeah. a, in a, as, as you were saying. It's yes. really quite peculiar. Yeah. And I, I just love it. And you know, as Leo pointed out, with the Gawain poet, he was writing probably up in the Wirral kind of mm. Cheshire kind of area. Um, and Middle English wasn't standardized. So people kind of wrote things down the way they sounded to them in their dialects. So which makes it really challenging, fun, you would say, to us kind of modern scholars trying to wrangle with it all. Um, but I would say reading it in the accent, if you know where the author's from, can also be a fun way into it. If you can read things in a Wirral dialect, <laughs> give it a go. <laughs> People in the library will be like, what is he doing? <laughs> a good question, thanks, Damien. Thank you. Got time for one more, if there is one more question. Otherwise, if I could just... <laughs> I very much, I'd like to... Um, before we... Thank Bex for the final time. I'd like to thank everyone here for coming this evening. We really appreciate you uh, supporting the series and making it all the way up to Stoke Bishop. And finally, if you'd like to hear about something completely different, we have our final lecture of the series on Tuesday, lunchtime in the Wills Memorial Building, where David Bernard will be talking about uh, security online and some of the uh, most famous security mishaps that have happened in the last 10 or 20 years. But that's for another time for today. Can we just finish by thanking once again, Dr. Bex Lyons. Thank you.